Live from Miami Beach, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering Veeam on 2019. Brought to you by Veeam. Welcome back to Miami, everybody. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. We go out to the events and we extract the signal from the noise. This is day one of Veeam on 2019. theCUBE's third year covering Veeam. First year we're in New Orleans, last year Chicago. Very cool and hip location here at the Fontainebleau Hotel. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host, Peter Burris. Colin Chatelier is here. He's the manager of storage and compute for Europe at Rabobank. Colin, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Good to yeah. see you. Yeah, got to be here. So tell us about <coughs> Rabobank. What are you guys all about? Okay, so Rabobank's obviously a bank. Um, we have uh, two main focuses. First of all, we're trying to be the biggest high street bank in the Netherlands, biggest retail bank in the Netherlands. And we've got, what, 7.3 million customers there in an adult population of 14 million. So that's not bad. Uh, and secondly, you, you know, the Netherlands is only a certain size and we're not going to grow it that much. So the, the biggest part of our new business is international. And, uh, and that's, the, the bank is all focused on providing food and agriculture expertise, loans, FX, spot work, anything that can help people um, or help businesses improve their uh, efficiencies and get more food from spade to plate. So what are some of your, the, the drivers in your business that are affecting your technology strategy? Um, drivers in a business, I, I, I guess, again, we've, we've got two different parts of the bank I should probably explain. So um, two years ago, we, we brought the IT of those two different parts of the bank together. Um, now, That's the retail the re and the international. The retail and the international. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, the, the international is all wholesale work. The, in, the retail is all uh, high street banking. So, the retail, those people really want to see their data. They want to see it on the, uh, on the web, they're checking balances, transferring pocket money to their oh, kids. Yeah. And if that doesn't happen, you know, that's uh, a tragedy and embarrassing. So we can't be responsible for that. As a result, one of our, our watchwords is always on. So we need to make sure that data is always available and we need to make sure that systems are always up for them. <clears throat> Part of that really is, you know, occasionally it won't always be on. So you need to be able to recover very quickly. And getting a, a product that's simple to use for recovery and fast to recover was really part of that strategy. That's where Veeam came in. So when you had to merge those two sort of IT operations, uh, obviously there was more than the data protection side of things, but talk generally about what the challenges were, but then specifically about the data protection piece. Okay, um, so bringing two IT departments together, of course, gives you a choice. Uh, am I going to use product A or product B, or sometimes product A and B and, and not C? That gave us an opportunity to, to really uh, do something that's not that common, I think, in the backup world, and you introduce a bit of churn. You, especially in retail environments, we have monthly backups. Sorry, especially in, in, in wholesale, I mean, we have monthly oh, backups, yeah. and those monthly backups go for anything from one year to 10 years. So trying to get away from a backup product where the, there's 10 years worth of legacy there to recover. Very tricky. But bringing the two, up, uh, to the two banks together gave us that opportunity to say, um, okay, well, we'll invest in, in, a, in a move. And we really put a whole series of uh, criteria together to try and figure out which one we were going to use. We moved from VMware and Hyper-V, we're moving everything to VMware. And from, we've, we have a number of other backup products, which I won't name because we're moving away from them. Um, and Veeam was the, was the winner there. Now why? Um, we needed something that would recover quickly. We needed something that would scale to the enterprise. We have 13,000 VMs being backed up today. We needed something that we could deploy re reasonably quickly and without too much effort. And actually when we, we deployed Veeam, we started off in November last year. Uh, by the end of January we were finished. Now there were a couple of thousand VMs already on oh, Veeam. Oh, I'm point. sorry. So it took it two months to, to two months to effectively move out an old backup infrastructure and move in a new one. Uh, sort of correct, yes. For dailies, oh, for, for dailies. monthlies, we haven't we haven't touched that okay, yet. So okay. we decide to just bite off one chunk at a time. Because you got ten years of, of legacy with your monthlies. So uh, right. We have at least ten years. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. So, yeah. all right, but still, that's pretty quick. Yeah. 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 Now, what about? Uh, cloud, every conference you go to, you see the sign, cloud data management, it's everything's cloud, cloud, cloud. It, it used to be in your business, the, the financial services business, cloud was an evil word. Yeah. It, is it still, what's your cloud strategy and how does data protection fit in? 
Well, we have a, a strategy of public cloud first. Mm -hmm. That's a lot easier to do for new applications than it is for existing applications, of course. So it tends to be that the existing applications are waiting for a, a technical refresh or waiting for a, a, an application rewrite. Uh, and new applications are going straight into the cloud. Um, how we're protecting that, that that's at, at the moment most of our data is held on-prem, whereas a lot of our applications, which can just be easily refreshed and push, re, re, republished, uh, is held in the cloud. So we, th th those guys, the DevOps teams, are performing their own backup, their own recovery. And so, uh, are you able to sort of for the on-prem stuff, are you yeah. trying to sort of make that cloud-like, sort of substantially mimic the cloud? Are you able to do that? You know, Peter, you're always talking about bringing the cloud experience to, to your data. Yeah. Is that something that you're able to do, or is that just sort of good marketing taglines? It's something that we are just starting to do again. Mm -hmm. So a year ago, uh, we had a private cloud that was um, just on the verge of being deployed. But we decided then that strategically we'd, we'd mothball that and encourage everybody to go to public cloud and not, um, not confuse them with two different choices. That's proving a little difficult. So one of the things that we find is that uh, development teams who are currently in the cloud can develop things with uh, software-defined infrastructure, but when they try and interface with the data or with some of the systems that are on-prem, then they come to a dramatic halt and they have to wait for the normal on-prem processes to kick through. So what we're looking at doing now is we just started a, a new process, or a new project, to create a, an on-prem, well, proof, proof of concept, on-prem cloud that will interact with the off-prem cloud and give the cloud-like experience. So we'll see. All right, so you have that challenge of agile meets waterfall, and now you're <coughs> trying to create some kind of e e equilibrium or really trying to modernize the, the on-prem? What's the strategy there? Well, I don't think it's agile meets waterfall. I think it's, it's DevOps meets um, traditional process. It's, uh, and, and yeah. Okay. Uh, but, <laughs> um, but, but how are we going to do it, you say? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I guess uh, what I'm getting to is, are you going to find sort of a common ground or are you really yeah. going to try to drive that sort of DevOps mentality into the legacy process? We'll, we'll, ha we'll continue to have um, a traditional or legacy, depending on what you want to call it, environment there. But we'll also have a, um, uh, a software-defined infrastructure environment on-prem. On if this proof of concept works, it's, it's uh, being built at the moment or being designed at the moment based on a, a VMware stack. What role will containers and microservices play in terms of facilitating that transformation? Um, at the moment, we, ha we, we have containers on-prem which are coming with applications, but we don't have a, a specific container platform which we're offering as a service on-prem. That's just, there's containers off-prem, of course, in our Azure cloud. Right, right, so, oh, so for the on-prem stuff, I mean, what does, that, what does that do for you and where do you see that going? The containers? Yeah. yeah. Um, at the moment, we have a policy of not providing a container service on-prem. Oh, oh, sorry, I, I, so I, 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 I heard wrong, sorry. Yeah, okay, so that's not a direction that you're going currently. Uh, no, but it, it may be, because yeah. we're, we're feeling our way forward, I think. But as you think about for example, uh, 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 banks, the financial service companies, have been at the vanguard of a lot of digital business practices because your core offering is data yep. and how it gets used. So is, is your overall business starting to rethink this notion of backup and restore from something that's just there to you know, make sure the data is available, to becoming a, an essential strategic capability that can span between the two modes as you're describing, but a common approach to making sure the data assets aren't compromised by re vendor relationships, by application development styles, by locations. Is that, are you thinking in those terms of a federated approach to ensure the services on the data that you need? Okay, well that was a very long question. Yes. But it's quite a short answer. Yes, we're thinking about it. Uh, no, we haven't done it yet. So, but I think you're absolutely right. One of the problems could be, for example, we deploy in, I don't know, Azure, AWS, Google, and we fall out with one of those cloud providers, and we try and move our backup data from provider A to provider B. Is it transportable? Yeah. Is, have we got the same policy that's been deployed in each of them? Yeah, so you don't so that whole thing needs to you be. You want to recreate that problem that you got with those 10 years of monthly backups with the new stuff too. Exactly, yeah, yeah. We've already made that mistake. One of the other challenges, <laughs> well, but you made it for you know, good reason. That was the state of the technology yeah. at the time and 
you had to have hardened you know, processes and that was you know, how you did it you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. What are the other problems or challenges that you hear from when we talk to financial services organizations is they, if their data exists, their data companies as Peter said, but their data exists in hardened silos. Again, for good reason. You had to protect that data, it was you know, mission critical. Regulatory family, family reasons. Jewels type of stuff. Now as you transform into the so-called digital business, everybody wants access to that data. Yeah. And so you've got that, that tough balancing act. So, uh, is that a, obviously a challenge for you? How are you dealing with, with that challenge? And data protection generally was, was unique to each of those silos. So how are you thinking about data protection going forward in terms of, terms of busting those silos? Um, well, I, I don't think we've, we've ever had silos of data protection. Okay. I think we've, our data protection has been uniform across the two banks, of course. Yeah, right. So, so now we've brought them together again. We, we have, uh, what, different retention characteristics, different ways of using a product. Mm -hmm. But over the last year and a half, two years, we've, we've uh, pretty much brought in the same processes. Um, but I, I don't think that any application on-prem or any that will be on the private cloud or the, the on-prem cloud will have anything different. It will use the same product, the same processes, and perhaps have more accessed by the development teams, the DevOps teams, to be able to fire off their own backups at, at the right time. You're talking about from a data protect, protection, protection perspective, yeah. and then potentially other things like microservices or containers over time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, what's happening at the show here? Uh, things you've learned, anything you've seen that's exciting you? Any of the announcements? <laughs> well, it's early days, isn't it? It's early yeah. days. Um, so I think the, the, the best thing for the show so far was last night when it going on the, on the boat, meeting some of the other execs and, and sharing some experiences with them. I think um, you know, one of the things that I always think is the best practice comes from worst experience. And I don't want to have all that worst experience myself. I want to, I want to mine <laughs> it from everybody else. And, yeah. so, so I think you, you can learn more in, the, in the, an hour in a social situation than you can perhaps in two hours in the, uh, in the, the conference room. There. So what are you hearing from your peers? What are they doing? Some of the challenges that they're facing? This digital business stuff, is it real? How are they dealing with it? Uh, okay, my peers. I think what, they, what they're feeling is that the traditional backup solution the traditional backup providers are just not quick enough on their feet. Agile in a, in a real sense, rather than a, uh, yeah, quote, 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 a marketing sense, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think the, 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 the traditional providers tend to be um, less grateful for the business, perhaps. You know, I, I heard about the number of new customers that, we, that Veeam are getting today, but uh, they seem to give a lot of attention to those new customers. Now, deploying 13,000 VMs in a relatively short period of time, we needed a lot of help from Veeam to, to overcome the obstacles as we hit them. And they were there when we needed them. And you know, that makes a difference, I think, because uh, especially when you're protecting your data and you need to be able to restore that data, you need a, a partner, not, not a vendor. So it's, it's as much the, the relationship as the technology is what I'm hearing. I, I don't think we would get into bed with a, a, a vendor who wasn't a partner as well. Oh, in many respects, it's almost like Veeam understands how to solve the problem, and their technology is a way of doing it easily and cheaply and reliably. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I, I want to follow up on that, because you know, some of the, the, the large companies I can infer who you're talking about, they might have big established direct sales forces, you know, meat-eating guys that are in the field that just go belly to belly. You know, Veeam, all channel, all indirect, how are they successfully partnering with you in a ways that the other guys may not be with, with that type of go-to-market model? Um, so we used a, a company called Proact, a, a reseller, to, to buy into Veeam. Um, I, I guess Veeam trained them up well because they, they had all the information at their fingertips and they represented us in the negotiation with Veeam. So it took away perhaps some of the conflict that you'll get in an early situation. Um, and, and then when we needed the, the direct help from Veeam, Veeam stepped up to, the, up to the board and started giving that direct help and, and not cut out the reseller, but the reseller wasn't needed anymore at that point. And that was help from a technology standpoint or a business term standpoint? Or technology, or, yeah. yeah. Just overcoming the, the problems. You know, a, a big organization has got a, a lot of networks, a lot of uh, LANs, VLANs, and we need to be able to punch holes through those VLANs, so it's right. quite interesting to, to be able to, to be told up front where we need to punch. Make this work. Yeah. Yeah, great. 
All right, Colin, well thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. It was, it was great having you. I'll give you final thoughts on, uh, on Miami. You're coming in from out of town and uh, you got the tour last night on the boat. What'd you think? Yeah. And uh, impressions of the conference. <clears throat> well, Miami, first of all, it looks like a nice place to live. Uh, we, as, we, as we cruised past all of those <laughs> gigantic uh, <laughs> homes, I didn't notice anyone in them, so <laughs> perhaps, perhaps one's going cheap. Uh, the conference, it looks good. I, I'm always surprised by how big it is. It's my second event. Um, and uh, yeah, they've got a hell of a lot of customers and seem to be loyal customers as well. You know, Nobody has a bad thing to say. Were you here in Chicago last year? Or I wasn't, was, I was here in uh, New Orleans. New Orleans, yeah, two yeah. years ago. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE, appreciate Thank it. Yeah. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. You're watching theCUBE live from VeeamOn 2019. Be right back.